right, Mr. Mayor, we are live and rolling. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. This is the City of Morro Bay City Council meeting. This is our regular meeting. It is Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. It is 5.30 p.m. and this meeting is being held via teleconference. Pursuant to Assembly Bill 361 and Government Code Section 54953, this meeting will be conducted telephonically through Zoom and broadcast live on cable channel 20 and streamed on the city website. Please be advised that pursuant to Assembly Bill 361 and Government Code Section 54953 and to ensure the health and safety of the public by limiting human contact that could spread the COVID-19 virus, the Veterans Hall will not be open for this evening's meeting. Thank you. And I will ask the uh, clerk if she'll establish a quorum, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Addis? Here. Council Member Ford? Here. Council Member Heller? Here. Council Member Barton? I do not see yet. And Mayor Hedding? Present. So we do have a quorum, and I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order and ask us all in our own way to just take a, a moment of silence, remembering the um, war in Ukraine, all of the displaced uh, people and the devastation that has occurred to that country. Thank you. Thank you. And if we could have our flag, we'll go ahead with um, the Pledge of Allegiance. And if we could stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And um, Mr. Uh, City Attorney, do we have a closed session report tonight? Good evening, Mr. Mayor. No closed session items to report. Great. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. And with that, we'll go to um, our council member reports. And let's start with council member Ford. Council member Ford, anything to report this evening, ma'am? Thank you, Mayor Heading. I actually do have a few items to report. I'd like to mention some upcoming Morro Bay events um, that are right around the corner. We have the Kite Festival, April 29th through May 1st, Cruisin' Morro Bay Car Show, May 5th through the 8th, the Citywide Yard Sale, May 14th and 15th. And we have a League of Women's Voter, this is actually not a Morro Bay event, this is an event for our county, um, the League of Women Voters of Slow County, they're hosting a Zoom at noon. <laughs> I like how that rhymes. Zoom at noon on March 28th, and it's called Housed or Unhoused, the Community Dilemma Over Public Spaces. Uh, if you'd like to register for that Zoom, you can go, and this is a little bit long. I found the shortest link possible. So you can go to my lwv.org backslash California backslash San dash Lewis dash Obispo dash County. So my lwv.org backslash California backslash San dash Lewis dash Obispo dash County. Again, that's the housed or unhoused uh, Zoom event there. And lastly, um, this announcement is for um, anyone who wants to meet with me in person over coffee. I do have a, a place this time. And, um, I'm going to be meeting anyone who wants to join me at the Foghorn Brew House, which is located at 2940 Main Street at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, March 29th. So again, at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, March 29th at the Foghorn. And that is all I've got for you. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the reminder on all those great community events that are coming up. Appreciate that. Council Member Heller, do you have any announcements, sir? Uh, I have no announcements uh, tonight. Thank you, Mayor. You bet. Thank you. Council Member Barton. 
She with us yet? Uh, yes, hello. I'm, I'm here. Um, I don't know what's become of my my picture, but I'm here. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, several things. Uh, Councilmember Ford and I uh, made a trip to Moss Landing to take a look at the Vistra plant there. Very interesting. Um, we learned a lot about what they're doing um, there, the um, things that they've learned and in, in, as they're, they're putting it together and um, what they might possibly have in, in mind for, um, for a, a battery plant here. Um, let's see, uh, in relation to the climate action plans, we got, uh, uh, Council Member Ford and I got together with um, uh, a couple of people around town and talked about uh, some of the um, possible ways of implementing climate action plans. And we'll be coming, uh, coming to you with more information about that. Um, my particular piece of it was doing some research in other cities and seeing how they're implementing theirs. It's, um, it's interesting to see how different it is from place to place. Um, let's see. And I met with Mayor Heading to uh, discuss the um, uh, advisory body handbook. So those are my reports. Thank you. And I think we're about halfway through that too. So thanks for working with me on that. Um, Councilmember Addis. Thank you, Mayor. I did want to uh, make an announcement, especially since um, Councilmember Barton mentioned climate. And I received an invite, and the community is invited to a free screening of Youth v. Gov. It's on Friday, April 22nd at St. Benedict's Episcopal Church on Los Osos Valley Road and Clark Valley Road in Los Osos. And the special thing about this uh, film is it's actually based on a movement of 21 plaintiffs, now ages 14 to 25, who have been suing the U.S. government for violating their constitutional rights to life, liberty, personal safety, and property um, through actions around creating the climate crisis. So it's really a story of young people who are standing up for their future. And again, it's a month from today, April 22nd, which is a Friday. It's called Youth v. Gov, and it's at St. Benedict's Episcopal Church on Los Osos Valley Road and Clark Valley Road in Los Osos. And um, more information is available at uvgovfilm.com. So Y-O-U-V-G-O-V film.com and thank you great thank you for that appreciate it and um, i'll announce as a reminder that our next city council meeting um, which will be april the 12th will be our first live council meeting in just over two years so we will be back at the veterans hall folks um, ready to greet and meet you um, in live fashion, there'll be an option for you to call in. Um, if you'd like to make public comment via the phone, you'll be able to do that. That's, we call that basically a hybrid model. And uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit later this evening. But just wanted to let you know, again, many of you have been asking us and sending emails, when are we gonna go live? That will be um, at the April 12th meeting. And if there are any other advisory body, um, meetings that will be occurring live, they will be announced um, on the website when the agenda is posted prior to the 12th. So thank you for that. And I'll turn to Mr. Collins for the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor and council members and members of the community. Um, just a, a brief update. Um, you know, we've been getting a, a lot of questions um, from community members about um, the Harbor Department and the waterfront in light of um, discussions around the RV program that's being discontinued. So just want to let folks know we did a bit of a primer in the city manager's update uh, for this month, uh, when it, which went out today. Um, so you can find that on the front of the city's website at www.morobayca.gov. On the left side, you'll find the city manager's update heading, click on that, and then you can find this month's edition, which it's a good two page summary uh, on how it functions, the operations, capital needs, our current condition and some some options moving forward. And I really want to thank Eric Endersby, the Harbor Director for, for providing it, input on that. So that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Scott. Appreciate that. 
That brings us then to um, our presentations um, tonight. We have our quarterly Chamber of Commerce presentation. I'm happy to have and announce that um, the CEO of the Morro Bay Chamber, Erica Crawford, is with us this evening. Welcome, Erica. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let me just go ahead and share my screen. Give this a whirl. Everybody seen that? Loud and clear, coming through and seeing well. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Erica Crawford, President and CEO of the Morro Bay Chamber. Very happy to, to be here tonight and provide you with an update on our economic development status report. Um, I'll try not to speak a thousand miles per hour. Um, let's see. And I'll try to make sure that this works. Let me do that again. I've been messing with the Google rather than the, uh, there we go. Okay, so here we are. Uh, I always start and I will continue to start with just a, a reminder of who we are. The Morbid Chamber of Commerce is an independent nonprofit. Uh, we're a 501c6. We exist to serve our members. Um, we are a three C's chamber, which means we're here to catalyze growth and opportunity uh, to convene community leaders and to champion a strong community. And we do that with three staff members. It's myself, we have Lindsay Hansen, who is our full-time membership director, and Jody Olier, who's our uh, pre sort of a program coordinator and creative director. Uh, we're governed by a 12-member board of directors. This year, our board chairperson is Jeff Eccles. We have a 14-member governmental affairs committee. The co-chairs there are Stephen Peck and Ken McMillan. We have a seven-member ambassador committee. The co-chairs there are Ray Reardon and Brad Evans. And we do form various task forces uh, when issues arise that are of interest or concern for the business community. What I'm here to update you on tonight is our economic development contract uh, that stands separate uh, and apart from our mission as a Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are contracted with you uh, to provide economic development services that are very specific, it's a specific scope of services. We deliver on that with my Chamber Board's approval at your pleasure uh, as the City Council. And we do that in close coordination with city staff. So our scope overview is sort of uh, broken into three different areas of interest. Um, we provide designated proactive representation in the economic development realm for the county. Uh, we do tactical ex execution of economic development strategy here in Morro Bay and relative to the region. And then we also do all of this sort of under the umbrella of preservation and material enhancement of Morro Bay's small town character. Um, I thought you'd like to see a little bit of your ED contractor at work. Um, I am your representative uh, for this contract, although you do have the benefit of my very strong staff behind me. Most of my time, or a lot of my time regularly, daily, uh, is spent in coordination with the city manager, uh, with community development director. We meet right, very regularly, weekly and biweekly, to discuss projects that are in the pipeline and to do um, strategy and policy implementation or to review that. I'm very fortunate to sit on the development review team meetings. I make as many of those meetings as I can, working with your community development department, your planning department, and your uh, public works staff. Um, very helpful time spent reviewing projects that are actually in review um, and allowing me the opportunity to, to offer assistance um, with applicant and city coordination. And then I do serve as a, a member of the REACH Practitioners Network. REACH is the Regional Economic Action Coalition for both San, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. Uh, the Practitioners Network is a group of, like it says, economic development practitioners. Uh, we are linked with GoBiz, so we are sort of the first filter for projects that are coming um, from businesses that are interested in making investments in our state. New this year, I thought you'd like to know that I am working very closely um, and in a really very strong way with uh, Visit More Bay, which is a another independent nonprofit 501c6. It's the Tourism Business Improvement District. I'm serving on their four-year strategic plan initiative. Um, the sort of a, a member of that uh, that working group that's going to start work, their work this month. Um, and I also sat on their uh, review panel for their marketing firm that they recently uh, entered into an arrangement with. And then I did also, I was tapped to sit in on a pre special project with REACH. Uh, they were, I was on a review panel uh, 
reviewing consultants who answered a request for proposals on waterfront infrastructure um, for both San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. Um, I think that's very pertinent for our waterfront community. Uh, it's a lot of time spent in meetings, so I thought you'd like to know that there is a work product that came out of all of that with REACH. Um, the Practitioners Network created a micro team and we worked on creating a regional business case. This is a marketing tool uh, that we've deployed to try and get businesses interested in investing in the state to be interested in investing in our two counties. I thought you'd be interested in seeing two particular slides related to key industries. This first one, renewable energy and clean tech, very pertinent to Moore Bay. You see here they're calling out the world's largest battery plant, uh, Mr. Court. They're, they're property owners and they're making their investment or, or their project is in review now. Um, and then looking at some of the assets and opportunities in our community, offshore wind, uh, very interested in and very engaged in uh, that process, BOEM. Um, and then the a clean tech incubator is being explored. Um, there is grant funding available. Uh, this is a, a project based through the Cal Poly Hothouse or the SBA, SBDC or CIE, it's a lot of acronyms. Uh, but they're very interested in citing a, an incubator, a business incubator in Moore Bay uh, related to clean technology. So I'll get into the three prongs of how we deliver um, our economic development services. So first, tactical execution of strategy. This is in our own backyard here in Moore Bay. Uh, our strategy has three prongs also. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to refer to it as our roadmap to success. This is what we do every day on the ground, business assistance with people who are making investments. I thought for this update, I would show you a few of the people that we've been working with, a few of the businesses. Um, these are, this the, the assistance that we provide ranges from, you know, getting them uh, aware of the neighborhood caught program, issues with public safety, connection to police, um, connection to community development, if they're interested in getting signage or murals painted, um, anything from tree trimming and issues with public works, and then of course marketing. Um, Electric Valley Vintage and Goods, brand new business in our downtown. Uh, they are one of what will be four new businesses on the corner um, right across from NHC and High Tide Deli there in downtown. We've been assisting them with connection to community development. They have a beautiful blank white wall that they're very interested in doing a mural and they have a nice parking lot they're interested in activating. Gaia's Garden is a total success story, a homegrown business, entrepreneurs, mother, daughter. I'd say the, the classification of assistance we've been providing them is getting them in front of community leaders and influencers and making sure that they are getting all the assistance they need in marketing. Buttercup Bakery, we know and love downtown. Carrie Rea is the owner there and has recently made a really uh, significant investment in improving her outdoor dining space. So our role in this was sort of as a, a mediator, go-between coordinator um, on what business wanted and what was and is allowed. Uh, Perfect Union, I included uh, the chamber and as relative to our contract, we are um, very engaged in what's going on with the Quintana pipeline conveyance construction. Uh, so we do communicate with Perfect Union regularly. Uh, and then this is another kind of local homegrown success story, a new business on the Embarcadero in the north part of the waterfront. Uh, it's a, a local business owner who's opened up a second location. He's in the Measure D zone. He had some questions about compatibility and how he could grow his business. So we got involved as ombudsman here. Uh, another prong, or I, I kind of moving into the development side of things, uh, incremental development and measure revitalization. These are uh, sticks in the ground, as I've heard Scott Graham talk about it. Uh, so this is a mock-up of the project over on Highway 41 by the high school. This is a new 83-room hotel project we were involved in and have continued to be engaged in as, again, a mediator, a go-between uh, translator. Allen Property Group, another... Um, hotel kind of uh, group and they are interested in and they're looking at uh, expanding into some space next to their masterpiece hotel or kind of um, re-envisioning what that could be. Harbor Walk Plaza, a project we are familiar with and are very excited to see coming to light now or coming to, to reality. Uh, another local business owner of a couple of decades um, who is creating from the ground up a brand new construction in the Tidelands Trust area. And her, her neighbor, Libertine Brewing Company, we are engaged there, uh, making sure that as that property owner and that business owner, I should say business owner, not property owner, is moving through permit review or project review, <clears throat> that we are uh, assisting in translation. 
there is some uh, exciting negotiation going on uh, relative to the lease on the corner of the center of our downtown. So we're tracking that. Um, and of course, Scout Coffee has uh, bought the bank, uh, bought Bank of America. So we're, we're in communication with the um, business owners there, making sure that their per permit process is going smoothly and that they are picking up their permits and getting uh, their project going. And uh, finally, I think this is the exponential in impact, you know, supporting catalyst site development. We are uh, supporting role on this. The city really takes the lead on this, um, but nothing speaks to it more clearly than, you know, offshore wind, a brand new industry looking to, uh, to sort of um, grow here in our backyard. And uh, of course the renewable battery or uh, renewable energy, the battery storage project out here uh, that Pfister has, we're engaged there again with permit process review mostly. Um, I'd be remiss to not give another shout out to the SPDC and the, the Cal Poly CIE. They were critical in getting our small business community through the COVID pandemic and their uh, guidance and assistance with federal loans and uh, state loans and, and crisis communication was um, very valuable to make sure that our small business community continued to thrive. And we see so many new businesses opening up in our own backyard. Uh, and they are partners with us alongside the Women's Business Center and SCORE. Um, additionally, this is, I'm almost done. Uh, the, we have two sort of finite projects in our scope. Um, one is to be project managers for sort of a revitalization of the flagpole banners that we have in the downtown and waterfront strategic plan area. You see in the center, those are holiday banners that were deployed thanks to private sector investment. Uh, so these businesses threw in their own money to get this done. And then the images to the right are gonna be sort of the year round banners that are in production now uh, that um, in perpetuity or, you know, whenever there are new events coming down, they'll come down and those events will go up. And then these will, you'll be seeing these quite a lot over the next couple of years. And then very exciting, just launched yesterday and we're on KSBY tonight, uh, me and your city manager, talking about a business improvement district feasibility study. This is um, being promoted as a more of a business survey uh, we're very interested in hearing from businesses in the waterfront and the downtown areas. We're asking them seven questions. It's a very brief survey, five minutes. It's all confidential. Uh, the purpose of the survey is to find out what's going on on the ground, uh, what the needs are, and to explore possible solutions. Um, as we know, the TBID has, um, they do an amazing job bringing overnight visitors to the city, but our survey is looking to um, seek ideas on midweek and off season, how to, how to get those customers that are local uh, or just visiting for the day. So we will, in addition to the survey, uh, be holding two focus groups, and then we will have that survey open until Sunday, April the 10th. The easiest way to find that survey probably is just to go to morrowchamber.org. We have a drop down menu, and then you can click and take the survey there. And the, uh, uh, the final sort of report will be aggregate data that should be useful for not only the chamber, not only the city, not only public works, the Harbor Department and Visit Moore Bay. Uh, we're anticipating feedback based on, or um, in the realm of beautification events um, should be really useful data. And we've been talking about doing this for quite some time. So we're very happy to get this done. Uh, this will be my last slide. Uh, you give me an opportunity. This is all the stuff that we do that's outside of the contract, but we're really excited to be back in person and hosting in-person events. We launched a breakfast program just uh, just last week and it was super successful and really fun. Uh, so we're gonna have a second one on April 20th. We're committed to doing these every month for a year uh, to give it some, give it some legs and, and make sure that it's a real program that can go. Um, it is, the tagline is a sterile-based place to get news first. Uh, so we'll serve breakfast and have speakers. Uh, we are doing our shop sip and stroll event tomorrow night. This is Lindsay's brainchild. We're really excited about it. We've got 15 different stops in the Embarcadero. Uh, people who are interested in participating can come to Carla's at 5 p.m. and get a wine glass and a wristband and a map and a lift down the hill from Central Coast Cart Rentals to go and sip and stroll uh, to all these businesses that are staying open late. And we are having a mixer. I think that date is incorrect. Uh, the second Wednesday of April uh, at Rock Harbor Marketing, uh, but it's hosted by the Community Foundation of Sparrow Bay. And I hope I didn't talk too long or too fast. Um, that's my presentation. No, no, that's very comprehensive overview. Man, you're you're busy, and you have basically three FTEs or um, two plus FTEs in your organization. You get yeah. a lot done. That's amazing. We do. <laughs> 
Appreciate Thanks. that. So I'm going to open it up and see if there are any council member questions for Erica from the chamber. Council member Heller, yes. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I don't have any questions, Erica, but you're an amazing uh, energetic force in the community and I'm amazed at how many things you're juggling and have going on at the same time. And thank you for all you do for Morro Bay. Yeah, you're very welcome. I love my job. I know that's cheesy to say, but it's true. It's different every day. Uh, we never get tired and my staff keeps up with me for sure. They push me. <laughs> any other comments or questions? Yes, Council Member Ford. I, I just want to say thank you as well to the to our chamber and Erica. You you lead with with grace and um, just enthusiasm, and you make people want to join you <laughs> and do more for our city. And I think that that's important in a leader. And I just really appreciate everything that you do. Thank you, Councilmember Mattis. Please. And just since you're here in person, the Chamber Gala was wonderful. I know it's been a few weeks now, yeah. but I um, just want to add that to the accolades that it was really a, a great event. And thank you to you and staff and everybody that participated in that. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, and I do just want to, I, I absolutely need to say that the partnership that we have with your city staff is like critical to our success in getting economic development done. Uh, you have a very professional staff. They're a delight to work with. They work really hard. The work that we've been doing on the development review team, I mean, there's so much going on in the city. So your staff is, is also just kind of killing it to be colloquial about it. Great, Erica. Thank you. And did I get the next mixer date right? Was it April the 6th? It's the 13th. 13th. I think. Yeah, I thought you'd. Okay, I yeah. just want to make sure That's I got it right. Presses, so we'll get that. 13th right. at 530, right? Yep. Okay. Rock Harbor Marketing. Yes, yeah, uh, hosted by the Community Foundation of the Sarah Bay. Great, thank you so much for that. Well, Erica, um, please um, thank your board on the part of the council for the great partnership um, with not only you, but your board. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to be able to meet with uh, your president, Eccles, um, on a monthly basis to exchange ideas and, and connect, but also thank your government affairs committee um, they have given outstanding input to us over the last few years, and, and I'm looking forward to continuing to engage with that group. So again, a great thank you to your organization from the city. Great partnership, and keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Have a great meeting tonight. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. That brings us to our second presentation item. Um, it's actually agenda item A11. I'll, I'll pull it now prior and I do want to um, invite uh, Natalie Renteria I think um, is Natalie with us Dana yes hello I'm here hi Natalie welcome hi. I have a proclamation that I'd like to read I wish we were live but uh, we will be in, in a couple of weeks but um, this is a proclamation of the City Council of the City of Morro Bay declaring April 2022 as month of the child and child abuse prevention month month and I'm going to read it to you. It says, whereas <clears throat> the Morro Bay City Council recognizes that every moment in a child's life is an opportunity for that child to learn, and the quality of these experiences may determine whether a child succeeds in school and in life, and that all children need caring and loving adults in their lives. And whereas April, the month of the child and child abuse prevention month, marks the time to recognize that our community's children are precious assets, that the quality of their early years in our collective responsibility, and that we commit ourselves to ensuring that each and every child has access to high quality early environment at home, at childcare, at school, and in our community that will promote their optimal growth and development. And whereas in solidarity of we are the CARE Initiative. We as a community of partners and leaders envision a San Luis Obispo County where all families can find and afford quality care for their children and where child care professionals are valued for their critical role in building a solid foundation for children and families to thrive in the world. And whereas Saturday, April 2nd, 2022, will commemorate Day of the Child at the annual Children's Day in the Plaza celebration from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. 
in the San Luis Obispo Mission Plaza. <clears throat> this year's celebration where children and families will have the opportunity to discover creativity, individuality, diversity, and the arts while exploring community resources. And whereas Friday, April 22nd, 22, our county will participate in the statewide raising of the children's memorial flag to honor and raise awareness about the many children in our midst who suffer daily from abuse and neglect and pledge our support for strategies that strengthen families and protect our young ones. And whereas April is National Child Abuse Prevention Month, month raising awareness and recognizing that each of us has a role in to play in ensuring the safety of our children. And we pledge our support for strategies that strengthen families and protect our young ones by promoting our normalizing parenting campaign and introduce Children's Memorial Day on Friday, April 22nd, 2022 at 10 a.m. with our Child Abuse Prevention Council colleagues throughout California. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Morro Bay City Council is proclaiming April 2022 as the Month of the Child and Child Abuse Prevention Month. And Natalie, we just wanna thank you and your organization for all that you do for our children and families. And I wanna offer you the opportunity to make some comments, please. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Natalie Renteria. I'm the Administrative Assistant for the San Luis Obispo County Child Care Planning Council. We, in partnership with families and the community, plan for and promote the highest quality and accessible services for the care of all children and youth. Thank you for this opportunity to celebrate our county's 54,000 children and their families. A special thank you to you, uh, Mayor Hedding and Council Members Don Annis and Jen Ford, who have been champions for children, supporting the effort to tackle the child care crisis. We are encouraged to continue partnering in these efforts to support Morro Bay's children, families, and businesses. April is Month of the Child and Child Abuse Prevention Month. We hope that you will join us and kids of all ages at one of the many events during this month. Saturday, April 2nd is our annual Children's Day in the Plaza at the Mission in downtown Slow. We will be joined by over 50 organizations sharing fun family activities and information. We are also um, partnering with the Department of Social Services and Center for Family Strengthening to raise awareness and recognize that each of us has a role to play in ensuring the safety of our children. We also hope you'll join us on April 22nd at the raising of the children's memorial flag at the Slow Downtown Courthouse. Again, thank you for this opportunity and we look for, forward to seeing you at the annual Children's Day in the Plaza and have our continued conversations and community driven solutions to challenges that impact local business as well as children and families. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Appreciate you again being here um, and thanks again for all the great work that you're doing. Hope to see you at the events as well that you mentioned. Appreciate it. Okay, that brings us to our public comment. This is general public comment for items um, on the agenda for which you can't stay and you'd like to speak to now or anything that you'd like to raise with regard to the city. And um, Highland, I'll go ahead and open up public comment and ask if we have any members of the public that would like to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First up, we have Wendy Went. Okay. Welcome, Wendy. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, this is Wendy Went from First Five San Luis Obispo County and the We Are the Care Initiative. I'm glad that I get to speak on the heels of Natalie's um, accepting of the, the proclamation regarding Month of the Child, because that's what I'm here to speak to you about. Um, as I said, I'm here representing We Are the Care and every April, as we celebrate Month of the Child and Child Abuse Prevention Month, and in preparation for April 2022, we've taken time to reflect on the children in our world and the role that they and their families play here and in our local community. We Are the Care is so grateful to this city council in Morro Bay and city staff for your prioritization and the needs of these children and families in this community and for the foundation you're helping to build to begin to alleviate the childcare crisis. 
we know that unlike other industries, the childcare market is not recovering at the same rate as other essential parts of America's economy. We appreciate your continued interest in what children and families are needing and how you can help to assist in this movement. We're also excited to share with you that starting in April and running through the beginning of the summer, we'll be launching a We Are The Care Community Voices Tour. This listening tour will be coming to a playground or park near you. Our hope is to be able to truly listen to those we hope to serve, and we are going straight to the source. The families in our community have endured immense struggles over the past two years, and while there's hope in sight, the child care challenge in this county is far from over. We want to adapt our focus to the changing concerns, needs, and wants of parents and families. Every visit to a new playground offers us the opportunity to hear from different community members within our county. Each city and town has a different set of needs, just as each family has a diverse set of needs distinct from others. Our hope is to hear what challenges parents are currently facing and also offer the opportunity to celebrate and show love and appreciation for local care providers and the crucial services they provide. Our very first stop on the Community Voices Tour is Children's Day in the Plaza at the first five booth on Saturday, April 2nd to kick off Month of the Child. After that, we will be setting up shop at different playgrounds all across the Central Coast. Be on the lookout for dates and times of the Community Voices Tour and we will be back soon to update you. For other ways to get involved with or learn about the We Are the Care initiative, please contact First Five Slow County or go to www.firstfiveslow.org. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great evening. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate that. Um, Highland, next uh, public comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Up next, we have Don Maruska. Okay. Welcome, Don. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I'm, I'm pleased to have this chance to speak with you. I, I first wanted to take just a moment. Uh, in my 28 years as a business owner here in Morro Bay, uh, it's been outstanding for me to see how the chamber and the city have been working together. And it's the best partnership I've seen in, in those 28 years and it's bearing fruit. And so thankful that uh, leaders uh, in the city and in the private sector are working together. I want to speak to you about uh, items C3 and C4. Uh, on C4, you're picking up a, a proclamation in support of the people in Ukraine. And certainly um, our family, like others uh, throughout our area, are you know really wringing our hands at the travesty that's happening in Ukraine and, and send our, our thoughts and, and prayers and our uh, support funds to those communities to try to help them in this time of need. This, uh, that proclamation is closely related to uh, C3 in my mind, because C3 is about uh, adopting the purpose and the initial activities of the uh, council subcommittee for climate action. And the connection is this, that really uh, Putin is getting his money for the war in Ukraine um, from oil and gas. And he's getting the diminished resistance from the West because so many countries are dependent upon that oil and gas. So we have an important role to play in our own lives. Uh, the second battlefield of this is really in our own homes and communities where we make choices every day of what uh, kinds of uh, fuel we're going to use for cooking, heating, uh, what we're going to, transportation choices we're going to make. And there's a great opportunity for us to make those choices in ways that are supportive of reducing our dependence on oil and gas. And when we do so, we free up supplies for elsewhere and we also diminish the pain at the pump that we're experiencing from these disruptions. And so um, I've put in the materials that uh, were included in the agenda packet for today, uh, an energy freedom fighters pledge. It, and that is to pledge as our household has to reduce our consumption by 10% uh, in this time of need. It goes back like we did in world, like our parents did in World War II, uh, to uh, make sacrifices for the betterment of democracy and safety around the world. So there's a series of simple things that people can do, lowering thermostats, turning off lights, sharing rides with others, avoiding per, uh, purchasing plastics, uh, quit bottled water, uh, switch to 100% renewable energy with your electricity provider. 
that can all enable us to get to uh, a way that we're sacrificing uh, in reasonable ways to help those who are in need. Encourage everyone to consider that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Uh, Highland, next public comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Up next, we have Aaron Oaks. Okay, welcome, Aaron. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, Aaron. Okay, my name is Aaron Oaks of Morro Bay, and uh, this is the start of my public comment. With all due respect to council and staff, what are you doing? We have the Harbor Department struggling for decades for revenue sources and city assistance. That's board business, which should be discussed in a special meeting. But all we get now are proclamations, one after another. We may agree on the sentiments behind these proclamations, but that's not policy. Later in the meeting, agenda item C4, the council will take up another political proclamation, this time for supporting the people of Ukraine. That's great. Will the council be inviting Ukrainian refugees into their homes? Will the council provide Ukrainians with, with uh, Stinger and Javelin missiles? Do we have any Morro Bay fighter jets to send to President Zelensky to help counter the Russians? Come on, folks. This is a hollow, empty gesture that's both performative and derivative. Leadership in local government is not about issuing proclamations that make us feel good about ourselves or provide cover for decades of neglect or prioritize political ambitions over pragmatism. This is about enacting public policy for Morro Bay. Now let's roll up, roll up our sleeves and get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Highland, next public comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, next, we have Betty Wenholz. Welcome, Betty. Thank you. This is Betty Winholtz. I want to ask if you would make a formal announcement and maybe put on the website that the beginning of nesting season, that trimming and cutting of trees uh, only happens in an emergency, um, that we've already had some tree cutting going on and being the tree city and the bird sanctuary that we are, that folks need to know this and new people coming to town may or may not be aware of this and so they mistakenly uh, engage someone to do that kind of activity and i would like to see the city be proactive in this and uh, thank your code enforcer for the help he gave uh, two weeks ago in uh, helping preserve this uh, law that we have thank you thank you betty um highland next public comment sir Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our last public comment is from Linda Winters. Okay. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Um, thank you and to everyone, city staff and council members. Uh, it is Linda Winters here. And I have a little lesson. Um, the keyword for tonight is community. And I have a couple definitions of the word community. It's a group of people living in the same place, just like we do here in Morro Bay. And the second definition is a feeling of fellowship with others, sharing common attitudes. Now, number one, Morro Bay's most recent community accomplishments, honoring the people and groups from that fabulous chamber gala, uh, number one citizen, uh, Jody Cox, uh, I, he's a mega volunteer, and I'm thoroughly convinced that the man never sleeps. Um, Carol Truesdale, who is our true living treasure. I know her, and she is an absolute doll. Number three, most lastly, Morro Bay Lions Club, the nonprofit of the year. Well-deserved, where the definition of community begins and is demonstrated always through this wonderful club. Um, number two, the Morro Bay community dinners at the Veterans Hall and the lunches at the Senior Center five days a week. Every single Monday for the past 10 years, the, the community dinner has served 27,000 meals. It's an incredible feat. And now the Morro Bay Lions are the host organizers for that event. Those volunteers are constantly giving the true sense of community to all that attend. Those weekly dinners provide 
food, clothing, and hot meals to anyone that wants to participate. When you see the camaraderie, feel the energy of this group of people, uh, this group of people produce, we all should take lessons from them. In fact, I invite every single member of staff and council to come to the Vets Hall between the hours of four and six any Monday and witness what true community is by definition. A and B, we all could learn from these people. And I hope to see you all very soon at the next live <laughs> city council meeting. All for now. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Highland, uh, was that the last public comment? Yes, Mr. Mayor. There are no more raised hands in the queue. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll go ahead and close public comment and uh, bring it back to council and just remember, uh, make a note of uh, um, for Mr. Qualick, perhaps we could get something on the website as mentioned um, regarding, I have my note here, um, nesting season and the issue with tree cutting. Um, nope. No problem. Location. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that very much. Okay, that brings us to um, item A. This is our consent agenda. Um, public comment is now open for consent agenda items A1 through A11. Any member of the public wishing to speak on our consent agenda? Uh, public comment is open. And Highland, do we have public comment, sir? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have one raised hand from Betty Winholtz. Welcome, Betty. Thank you. I'd like to speak to two agenda items. One is A6 and one is A8. Um, A6 has to do with uh, your uh, second reading of the what was the initiative uh, by the residents to uh, keep camping off the Embarcadero. And I'm just asking that you put that to a vote of the people. That was the intent. Uh, we don't know that 850 people speak for the 8,500 voters in Morro Bay and that um, we would prefer that that go to a vote of the people. We appreciate your confidence in our work, but uh, people were promised that they would be able to vote on this and, and that would be our preference. Um, regard to item A8, which has to do with the bluff top that was donated by Morro Cove when um, it developed those 30 houses above Tideland's Park. Um, and I, I guess I want you to know that back in 2001, when this was first um, uh, donated because of the developer to the um, uh, city, that I would hope, and I don't know that you have, but you need to go back and read the staff report from 2001 because it talks about the biological resources there. The reason it was preserved was because of the monarch habitat that had been destroyed where the houses were, um, that there were supposed to be 50% more trees planted. Not all of those have made it, nor have they been encouraged. Um, I think particularly, let me give you a quote. Um, the lot as open space and precludes the possibility that the zoning will be changed. Um, and that it needs to be uh, kept as is. Um, the concept plan for the bluff uh, top planning, planting plan was submitted and it's supposed to be kept in um, low growing plants and shrubs left in its natural state. Um, this was supposed to be an open space, not necessarily a park park um, that develops a lot of use. So in your uh, comments about this or in having um, the HOA that's next to it take on that. I think it's important that you honor the agreements that were put in place for this particular piece of property um, as it moves forward and you ac ask them to help protect that area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Highland, next public comment. There are no more raised hands in the queue. Okay, I'm gonna close public comment on the consent agenda bring it back to council uh, first or any items to pull hearing none um seek a motion uh for approval of a1 through a11 all right mayor i was a little late in getting my hand up yes i would like to pull a8 and a9 a8 and a9 okay any others 
Seeing none, uh, entertain a motion to approve A1 through seven and 10 and 11. I will move approval of uh, A1 through seven and 10 and 11. I'll second. We have second uh, by Councilmember Hiller. Uh, for those items, um, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote on that, please. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Ford? Yes. Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Council Member Heller, A8, sir. Actually, I'd like to address. A8 and A9 really from kind of a, several questions relating to grants. Um, I think the general public uh, is not always aware of how grants work. And I wanted to ask Greg Qualick a few things about these grants. Um, I guess, Greg, what I'm looking for, did, uh, how do you find these grants? Do you look for them actively? Does, is there another part of staff that refers them to you? Can you explain the process and how you come up with the grants? Sure, and thanks for the question, Council Member Heller. Um, you know, as you know, there, there's a variety of different types of grants. So I'll just start out by saying that, uh, for example, there's program grants that are kind of ongoing, usually applied for on an annual basis that support uh, city programs. There's also project related grants. So um, I, I assume we're talking about the project related grants since that's the subject of uh, items A8 uh, and A9. Yes. We find those grants in, in a variety of ways. Uh, sometimes if we're looking to fund, if we're uh, particularly eager to fund a specific project, we, we will do our own research uh, to do an aggressive search. Um, also, we get a lot of good tips uh, and updates from our lobbyists, our federal lobbyists, uh, the Ferguson Group, as well as our state lobbyist, Townsend. Um, and then finally, staff is uh, pretty plugged in to a lot of the state and federal agencies that uh, issue regular notices about grants. So we'll sign up for their, their e-newsletters and then get information about um, calls for projects and, and, and grants in that way. That's great, that's very helpful. And do most grants require matching funds? Uh, most of the project grants that we see do, it's not always true for like a program grant, they usually don't. And then there's some that fall in between. I mean, there uh, just generally speaking, there are, there's so many different types of grants under the sun. Um, state grants, I find, oftentimes have a matching requirement, but it, it really depends on the grants. It, it's not like a rule of thumb or anything. Okay. And uh, what's the what's the typical grant uh, time frame for when you apply for one, or does it vary a lot to when the decision is made? Yeah, again, it, it, it varies a lot. Um, so if, if you're asking like how long it takes to write a grant and then how long until we learn whether or not we're awarded, uh, I would say on average, it would take us two to three months to write the application. There's oftentimes, um, you know, community meetings that we have to conduct or um, outside uh, groups that external groups that we need to uh, coordinate with. Um, and then <coughs> oftentimes uh, we, we will learn within four to I would say nine months, whether or not we've, we've been awarded a grant. It just depends on, on the grant, as you said. Okay. And then with respect to the Morrow Cove grant application, what will be the role of the Morrow Cove HOA in the process? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, we've had a lot of interest in that particular uh, park or, or open space. Um, and uh, that so far has really been led by uh, the Morro Bay Historical Society. And uh, the city staff is, is supporting the Historical Society. Uh, and uh, in, that, in that coordination that, that, that we have with that group, um, Morro Cove HOA is, is a major stakeholder. So uh, we, we receive input from Morro Cove HOA, just as we do with other stakeholders. I, for example, there are some tribal groups that have also been contacted, but given the proximity um, of that uh, area to the Morro Cove development, uh, they, they obviously have a lot of input. Um, and we seek that input along with uh, input from, from other stakeholder groups. Okay, and then my last question, are you aware of the document from 2001 that uh, Ms. Winholtz was sp speaking to a few minutes ago? 
I'm, I'm vaguely aware that that the land was donated and, and was reserved as an open space. Uh, I, I, I would have to do an analysis into into those source documents to, to, to better understand uh, at what point it you know it, it became a park. My understanding is that it did become a park, or that there may be some step that we still have to take. So that's that's part of something that we're already looking into. Okay, great. Yeah, I look forward to hearing hearing back on that. And uh, those are my grant questions. Thank you, Greg. Hey, thanks, Councilmember Heller. Appreciate that. Um, I'll entertain a motion for approval of A8 and A9. I'll move approval of A8 and A9. Okay, is there a second? Second it. All right, motion by Councilmember Heller, seconded by Councilmember Fort for approval of A8 and A9. And um, any further questions? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote, please. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Ford? Yes. Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Okay, thank you for that. And that brings us to item C. This is our business items. Um, our first item is approval of Amendment 3 to the contract with Anvil Builders. Uh, for construction services for the water reclamation facility lift station and offsite pipelines. And um, I'll start with you, Mr. Qualick. I believe I'm turning it over to you and then perhaps Paul. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So I'll, I'll give Paul a, an introduction. I know he's a familiar face. He's been working on the wharf project for several years, I think since 2019, um, on and off. And then he came on board in a in a greater, more focused role um, last year, about a year ago, uh, where he was largely focused on the conveyance project and, and managing that component of the project. Um, as you know, uh, with the departure of Mr. Caceres from Carollo, um, Carollo then brought in a, a project management team uh, that consisted of a, a number of talented individuals, all of whom are still working on the project. Uh, Kyle was then named as, as the program manager uh, for Carollo for, for the WARF program. Um, and he has now transitioned into more of an advisor role. Uh, Kyle was really instrumental in, in helping the city um, understand the, the, the loan agreements um, and a lot of the financial uh, uh, background that, that was necessary to move forward with the project. And now that that work has been completed in coordination with our finance department, um, Paul is stepping up. Um, he, he was recently named vice president of Carollo and he's now stepping up to be the WARF program manager. So we are, we are very happy to work with him. We have a good working relationship with Paul, um, and we hope to close out this project uh, under his uh, guidance. So uh, with that all said, I'll, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Greg. And Paul, congratulations. Uh, great member of the team, and really appreciate all the work you're doing for us. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, so city council members and members of the community, I, I have a short presentation to introduce this uh, this item. So if you just bear with me just one second while I share my screen um, or I share my application here. Okay, so um, tonight we're presenting the uh, amendment for Anvil Builders uh, contract. Can everybody see my screen okay? <clears throat> Great. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, before we want to get, before I get started and get to the amendment, I just wanted to, um, Give a brief uh, general program update and then just do a general construction update on both the water reclamation facility and the conveyance facilities before we get into the detail. Uh, I'll try to keep my remarks short, you know, 10 15 minutes here before we open for questions. Um, so, first, general program update we've got some, um, we've got some good news and, and um, some maybe I don't know if it's good or bad news, just following on the, the topic of grants. The program team has applied for two different grants recently um, one for $10 million through the Bureau, a Title 16 grant submitted that application on March 11th. Uh, we should hear, hear on that by, um, by August, and that's specifically focused on recycled water. Unfortunately, the $20 million uh, Department of Water Resources uh, Urban and Multi-Benefit Drought Relief Grant application, wasn't, uh, the Moore Bay wasn't selected, um, but more opportunities are gonna be available. This isn't really surprising because this portion uh, of the program is not as mature as maybe some of the others, and, a lot of grant programs are really looking for shovel ready projects before they want to um, advance those. So we will be um, applying for grants in the future to try to continue to, to, um, to help the city with funding, um, funding the program. <clears throat> um, 
had a great opportunity to visit with the uh, EPA's WIFIA staff last Monday. Um, they came on site. That's just a general um, uh, site visit to take a look at the project and, and to do some um, verification of some of the, the requirements of the funding agreement, things like American Iron and Steel, uh, the, the labor um, the certified payroll and, and things like that, but also just to generally tour the site. They're starting those site visits up again now as we as we start to return to work from um, from uh, the COVID restrictions. And then last, as uh, Greg said, uh, it is my privilege to be able to serve as your program manager now. I have been involved in the program for several years now. It's a great program. Morro Bay is a great community, um, and uh, and I'm really excited to be able to uh, uh, lead our team, a uh, very uh, talented group of individuals, uh, to close this program out and close the, the projects out. So again, my privilege to uh, serve as your program manager. <clears throat> I don't want to say too many words. I know a lot of people uh, around town know that we're we're working all over the place. Anvil Builders, uh, who's who's in. Uh, I say in everybody's front yard, but really is is uh, the most prominent contractor we have working on this. Uh, they're all over town. They're really pushing hard to get the project done um, and to meet our schedule. Um, they actually have a new leadership team in place. Uh, everyone from field staff, uh, we have a new general superintendent, new project manager on the ground here for for Anvil, and then they've had some leadership changes in their corporate office, uh, and we've we've gotten to know those gentlemen. Um, very well uh, over the recent weeks, we're we're very optimistic that um, that Anvil is uh, is is going to bring this home um, and and bring it home successfully for us. Uh, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. So I'll, I'll touch more on the schedule as we get into the actual change order. So these these two pictures here, Pump Station A. This is on the Embarcadero, as you can see um, from past pictures. I don't recall uh, whether we've shown. Uh, but we've buried a lot of the best work that Anvil's done here, and they're really pushing hard to get to this uh, this area right here so we can start constructing the electrical building um, to energize this pump station uh, and, and move on. It will look much like the electrical building at Pump Station B, which, as you can see, is coming out of the ground. So Pump Station B, a lot of underground work is already done, and now you're starting to see what, uh, what everyone will see from now on um, as the project is being completed. South Bay Boulevard, um, one of our, uh, um, I think, most prominent road closures that we've had or road restrictions that we've had. We're making great progress heading toward the water reclamation facility. As you can see from the aerial photograph here, the drone photograph, we're pushing forward. Interestingly enough, this was taken about, I think, maybe a week or two ago, and uh, now Anvil is up under Highway 1 and is actually uh, in, this, in the uh, work site now. So we're optimistic we're making great progress in, um, under, on South Bay Boulevard. Uh, and, and pushing toward that. Actually, also starting to test pipeline segments um, uh, that they've already put into the ground. Uh, bike path and the utility bridge in Lila Kaiser Park, as you can see here, we're making great progress. This is a trenchless crossing right at the entrance of uh, the bike path uh, to get under a jurisdictional waterway. Uh, we're starting to do site preparation for the uh, crew that's currently working within the Vistra property to move on to the bike path soon to start pushing what we call the joint trench toward the utility bridge. And then this here, um, hopefully you can see this okay and the shadows aren't too bad, but we are building the utility bridge. So um, that was that's a, a milestone that we were very excited to, uh, to achieve is to get, get started on that construction. Um, this, uh, I believe this is over by, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly where this is, but you can see we're doing final paving in this area here. So we are making great progress on uh, the underground construction um, and uh, um, continuing to progress the work um, in a good in a good manner. Things are, are going well. We're, we really feel like we've turned a corner on the uh, pipeline construction. So the work construction itself, um, uh, this is going uh, amazingly well. We have a lot of equipment that has been set um, on the site. As you can see, it's really starting to take shape. Uh, pictures here, this is our um, uh, purified water pump pumping station um, here on the upper right. And then uh, the, the photo on the lower right here are the, um, this is the biological process. This is actually where uh, the magic of wastewater treatment, plant, uh, wastewater treatment happens. We, uh, this is where we, a biological process that we use to clean up the uh, wastewater to make it um, uh, uh, permittable to discharge to the ocean and also set it up for uh, converting to purified drinking water. So uh, good progress on construction. Uh, uh, over the last several months. 
So turning our attention to amendment number three, uh, the staff report uh, provided quite a bit of information um, about what's included in this amendment. I will breeze through. We do have uh, detailed slides for each one of what we call the potential change orders. Those don't become uh, final change orders until you all approve the amendment and we increase their contract amount. Um, but with this particular amendment, we are uh, increasing, uh, proposing to increase uh, Anvil's contract amount by $241,317 and add 153 days to their schedule for um, work restrictions and other delays that were uh, beyond the project team's control. <clears throat> First uh, PCO, additional project signage. I think anyone who's driven along Quintana knows that we have peppered that road with signs to tell people to slow down, please, and that the road is rough. Uh, kind of a funny story. I'm not sure how well you all can see this, but this sign right here says two Los Osos. Uh, we bought two of those signs that both, neither one of which made it 24 hours before it was, they were stolen and presumably taken and put in a, gar a garage or a bar in Los Osos. So uh, at some point in the future, we'll conduct an investigation into Los Osos to see who might have those. Um, we've since made uh, those out of cheaper signs, and uh, now we're very successful at uh, having those um, uh, stay on our site. So that was kind of a funny, um, a funny thing that happened uh, right around the holidays. Got about nine thousand dollars for this. Uh, we originally included a five thousand dollar allowance, and so we've uh, we've actually uh, increased the amount of signage by almost uh, hundred uh, percent over what was originally bid. Um, felt like it was needed for uh, better traffic control, uh, businesses open sign, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we call this part two of the SoCal gas delays and disruptions. Um, much of our alignment parallels a 16 inch high pressure gas main for Southern California gas. Um, Southern California gas, there's a lot of construction going on in the area and they require a standby employee to be uh, nearby anytime there are ground disturbing activities being conducted within 10 feet of their gas main. And in some cases, um, they require it when you're uh, even uh, closer. So uh, in this particular case, um, scheduling has been a challenge between both SoCal Gas and Anvil, just the nature of this project. Uh, and so uh, anytime SoCal Gas uh, doesn't show up when they say they can, either because of training or because of other uh, work, work shortages or, or labor shortages, then Anvils unfortunately can't start their work on time. And so over the course of the last uh, four to six months, they've incurred another $20,000 of standby charges waiting for um, um, uh, SoCal gas to show up on site. Um, it's just, it's, it's one of the unfortunate circumstances of working near high risk utilities and uh, the policies that, that we have around those, um, uh, around those gas mains. So um, the time extension, um, we, we call this California slow 16. This is an area um, of a rich cultural resource area that was identified in the EIR um, and we have, uh, that we've known about and we've done extensive investigation to try to map out the, uh, how much of the project has been in, or would impact that area. Um, and so we've talked about this in the past. And, and so um, uh, several months ago, the council approved a contract extension and a change order for um, uh, delays caused by uh, State Historic Preservation Office um, stoppage of any uh, ground disturbing activities. Once that was resolved, we had some additional work that needed to be done due to the funding source for the program, federal funding, um, uh, really ramps up the requirements that we have for um, investigation, monitoring, protection of the environment, uh, and so forth. And so from the time that we resolved the matter with SHPO, got the entire project cleared, we were uh, restricted from one particular area, and that was at the Pipe Bridge and Lila Kaiser Park and, and some other areas. We've redesigned a portion of the project to uh, minimize impact to that area, but also, but um, uh, the pipe bridge itself, uh, it's still, it's still due, due to our testing was of concern to SHPO. So um, we've recently resolved all matters with SHPO and we've begun pipe bridge construction. And so between the time that, that we um, got the, the release from SHPO until they were able to start based on our schedule analysis, Anvil was delayed 153 days. Um, and that, has ex that extends the contract completion date to September 3rd, 2022. Um, uh, and, and later on, I have the actual uh, original completion date. So 153 days from uh, uh, to September 3rd, 2022. This is a no cost change um, at this point in time. Anvil was not uh, delayed in what we call their critical path. 
meaning the activities that are necessary to get the entire project completed. They had other things that they could do um, and uh, work on and may not have even had labor or equipment available to do this. So um, this is not this this particular change does not cost the city uh, anything um, at, at this point. Uh, one thing I will say is the excavation of the pipe bridge um, because of the different activities that we have to uh, that we have to conduct there. Um, is, is going to take longer than when was originally bid. So uh, there will be another analysis down the road of, of the actual impact of, uh, of the slowed construction at the pipe bridge. We've had to change a shoring system and excavation methods, which is actually gonna slow Anvil down from what they originally planned in their bid. So we will be back uh, after the pipe bridge is, is completed to uh, discuss that. Um, this particular uh, change order reroute joint trench below state waterline. Uh, this is an interesting uh, change in this particular one. This is a combination of um, of inaccurate as built plans, inaccurate markings in the field, um, unknown uh, own ownership of utilities. So uh, just about everything that could go wrong in this particular case went wrong. Um, and so it was marked incorrectly and they started digging. Uh, they remarked the location, they found another water line, they, they actually uh, verified ownership. And so in the end result in this was, even though Anvil wasn't necessarily delayed by anything, uh, it did, they did incur approximately 144,000 in additional uh, excavation uh, effort and delays caused by the, uh, uh, the uh, unearthing, if you will, of uh, these mismarked and um, inaccurate uh, utilities. Um, next PCO, and I know I'm going kind of quick through these, uh, but next PCO was the potholing of existing utilities at the, the pilot injection well. So um, I would pause and say good news is that we received bids today for the pilot injection well, and we did get one bid so we can move forward with the um, recycled water component. Uh, we were concerned, if you recall, we had to actually rebid that pilot injection well before. So our team went back to work. We clarified some uh, of the requirements and we um, worked with uh, our, ge our hydrogeologist to um, outreach to drillers to make sure that we could actually uh, get, this, get, get some bids for this project. So we're very pleased that we got a bid uh, and we can actually move that forward. Uh, but in this particular case, we, because we had Anvil on site, because they are working in this area and they actually have the bike path closed, we requested that they go and pothole these utilities uh, and, and as part of the conveyance facilities because they had the equipment there, uh, they had the people available, they've got, um, they've been doing this type of work all over the place, all over town. So um, that's what this, this was because there's some existing gas mains and other um, uh, utilities in the area uh, of the Vista property where we're doing this. Almost there. Um, so thank you for bearing with me on this. Um, so a broken water, water line at Quintana Road and Kings Avenue. Uh, we're still in uh, discussions with Anvil on who, on, on actually how this got broken. And, and um, as you all know, the, these, these things happen sometimes with contractors where uh, something breaks and then the fingers start getting pointed. And, and so we're still working with them on that. But in this particular case, 6,200 bucks was for the city. Um, uh, the city requested repairs to this water line so that we could get it back in service. Reality is, is that the city wasn't going to go dig this up, and and um, they were already Anvil was already there, so uh, they, the city agreed to pay the expense just to make this water line repair. Um, so again, still in discussions with Anvil on on uh, the merit of any claim that they may have for uh, whose fault this was, whether it was the city's or whether it was theirs. Uh, last item. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Um, so uh, we had, uh, if you recall, the microtunnel, uh, the, the tunnel that went under the uh, roundabout, which we've talked about a number of different times, uh, both at council and in other uh, forums. Uh, that that uh, area that used to be the um, the U-Haul area over it's the northwest side of the roundabout. Um, as we dug down to get that pit excavated, we got into a, an old dump. Uh, that uh, I was talking to the archaeologist today and, and wanted to understand uh, what this was. And so this was a known historical site uh, where um, from about seven to 11 feet deep, um, people used to dump things way back when. And she said it was active for 50, 60 years from the late 1800s into the 50s. And so um, um, we were, Anvil, 
incurred additional costs in this area around forty-five thousand dollars to um, uh, go through and look through dirt and, and to try to protect those artifacts. So we took a picture of what was found. So it was kind of neat. Um, uh, archaeological digs are always interesting, but um, sometimes they're not so interesting when you're in the middle of a big construction project. <laughs> so I know I went quite fast uh, in that. Um, so uh, just in summary. Uh, Anvil's base contract amount originally bid thirty-one thousand or thirty-one million uh, four ninety-three six seventy-five. Amendments one and two totaled one point two, just over one point two million dollars. Uh, with this amendment, amendment, the revised contract amount is uh, thirty-two million nine hundred ninety-six thousand nine hundred seventy-nine dollars. Um, and then with the addition of one hundred and fifty-three calendar days from the original contract end date of April third, twenty twenty-two. We now have an extension to September 3rd, 2022. Before I take questions, I do want to touch on a couple of items as we have this slide in front of us. Uh, in past council meetings, um, I believe Council Member Heller has asked uh, for more information around contingency, and I do want to acknowledge that uh, in the staff report, we did say that um, due to the low amount of contingency that we had remaining in the conveyance line item, we did have to transfer from contingency from the work. Um, and to cover this particular uh, line item so that we didn't exceed the overall contingency budget um, that was allocated for construction. Um, so we had to be able to cover this. Uh, one thing that we are doing right now is we're working with uh, staff and the program team uh, through the annual budgeting process to um, rebaseline the uh, program budget. So uh, that, pro that work is in progress. There are a lot of people working very hard uh, under Mr. Fogg's direction and Ms. Johnson Rios uh, to develop that, that uh, budget. So we will be coming back for a budget request uh, uh, later um, through the normal annual budgeting process. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, as far as the schedule goes, <clears throat> you see a revised end date of September, 20, uh, September 3rd, 2022. Um, that would include final completion uh, for the project, meaning everything is done, all road striping, all final paving, any broken curbs, all testing, everything, the system started up and turned over to the city. Um, at this point in time, we don't necessarily believe we're going to make that date. And as I said, we're going to be, uh, coming back to you all once we get through pipe Ridge uh, abutment construction for another, um, revised contract end date. Um, we are working toward a, fall date to get the system started up with final completion by or before the end of the year. Um, so um, that is that is where we are at this point in time. A uh, couple different things that I realized I forgot to mention, and I can take those in questions if you all want uh, to find out more about South Bay Boulevard and any other uh, uh, of the bike path, schedule restrictions or anything like that. So with that, I will be glad to take questions. Hey, thank you, Paul. Um, thanks for the great staff report and um, the comprehensive overview on the slides and, and the additional information. Thanks to Council Member Heller for asking for that. So we're going to go ahead and open this up for Council Member questions. And uh, let's see, do we have any questions of Paul? Council Member Heller, I see your hand, sir. Dang, I thought I was going to get out of it. <laughs> no, no. How you doing, Paul? All right. Welcome aboard in your new uh, your new role. Glad to have you. Thank you. Uh, in looking at this amendment, a uh, couple of questions about some of the proposed change orders. The first one has to do with 9.2, the Southern California gas delays. Um, dealing with public utilities and inspection uh, agencies and so forth is all, always kind of troublesome. Can, can you explain to me what the process was in terms of notifying Southern California Gas about the progress of the work and who did that? And uh, just explain a little bit about that. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> Anvil Builders is responsible for, on a daily basis, alerting Southern, Cal Southern SoCal Gas uh, to where they're going to be, when they're going to be within 10 feet of SoCal Gas's gas main. Um, so then SoCal Gas is then responsible for getting a standby employee on site. And this is a service they provide just as, you know, they are gas providers. So as part of the rate that the city pays for gas uh, and, and the customers pay for gas that protects their utilities. Um, so it's a, it's a communication process that's often handled by email. 
Um, and, and Anvil generally has to be very specific about where they're going. So in some cases, Anvil has not necessarily met their schedule. And so SoCal gas has shown up and then they weren't digging where they were supposed to. But in these, this particular case, um, a lot of times SoCal gas employees, their standby employees would have uh, required meetings or training that they would have to go attend in the morning. And so they wouldn't show up until eight or nine o'clock in the morning, even though Anvil had, re had um, requested them in advance, which I think they have 24 hours notice that they have to provide. Um, and so this was generally, these are an hour or two here and there throughout the course of the project. Um, and um, so it, it adds up after a while when you have a crew of Anvil size, um, an hour or two is very, uh, is, is very notable in terms of the amount of money that it's, um, that they, that we have to pay. Okay. I understand that. Uh, that sounds kind of typical, yeah. uh, unfortunately, unfortunately uh, yeah. dealing, dealing with public utilities. Uh, is there anything in the contract or in the bid document saying that the owner would be responsible for delays by a third party, specifically, uh, utility companies? Oh, I, you know, I have to confess, I'm not specifically familiar with that, whether that, um, that provision exists, but it is a condition um, that is, that is actually a great question. And I would have to tell you that I would have to actually follow up to go find the words, but the answer is yes. I mean, the, uh, in the end, it's a requirement of the contract that, um, you know, there is a level of service that SoCal gas provides the city and, and. And unfortunately, in this particular case, the city's in kind of a weak position as it relates to those those types of conditions. Um, the contractor would view that as a changed condition from what they would have expected uh, and what they would have bid. I know it's a little bit unrealistic, but unfortunately, in black and white, when we have those plans, we say you call them, they expect it, and then when those site those conditions differ, they come back on us and they ask us to to compensate them. Okay, I, I mean, to me, it seems like kind of a routine situation that. Utilities up when you ask them to, and I've never, I've never seen a change where the owner is charged for that because it's a third party that we have no control over. Uh, so um, I don't know about that one. Uh, the other one I want to talk to you about is uh, the change order sixteen, the rerouting of the trench, and so forth. And I appreciate all the detail that you went through here. Um, this does seem almost like a comedy of errors. So lots of things that went wrong. In general who's responsible to identify the lines that are found uh, in the, in the ground? The utility owner. That's the utility they, owner. So with the state water system. line, uh, yeah. is there someone from the state who came out to confirm the location of the state water line? Yes. Yes. And they mark that, it through the USA program and then they were responsible for it. And then, and then Anvil would pothole it. And unfortunately, it was it was originally marked and they came back and remarked it and it was in a very different place and then when anvil went to pothole that utility it was actually under the utility that they potholed so that they they thought they had gotten it they thought that was the line because that was where it was marked and then when they started digging it was actually lower the state water line was actually lower than the utility that they had potholed so did the state mark it incorrectly or how did how did that Yes, there was, yes, the state is responsible for, or whoever the state might contract for uh, marking their utilities. Okay. Um, what else? Okay, those are my questions on that. Thank you, Paul, appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Councilmember Heller. Councilmember Barton. Hi, Paul, it's nice to have you back. Ah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I was intrigued by your uh, slide at the beginning of your presentation about the progress on South Bay Boulevard mm -hmm. and that, that it has now arrived at the plant because this morning I was coming back from swimming at Cuesta and I happened, I looked over and saw all these guys in a giant square hole and I wondered what they were doing, but now I know, so thank you. No problem, no problem. And just since you asked about South Bay Boulevard and Maybe you should wink at me and say, when's that going to be open? <laughs> I, w I was going to ask if she did. not <laughs> <laughs> um, So as you can tell, that work is going very well. And one of the things that's interesting about, about underground work is, is and, I, and it took me a long time to, to learn this as I did more and more projects, was that um, about the time that everything gets backfilled and I think they're done, it's like a month later before they're actually done. So um, we have committed to have that road uh, fully opened by the end of April. Um, we beat it, but we want to be out of there by the end of April. We've worked with Anvil, um, and that means 
fully paved. Um, final paving, that's what we've agreed to with Anvil. They may need to come back and stripe, so that would be a later activity, but that won't be as impactful. Um, but the one thing I do have to say is, um, so that's the joint trench crew. Then those guys are going to go over to Atascadero Road. And then we have a water line relocation that we have to do in the intersection of South Bay and Quintana. We can't do that in the current traffic configuration. So we'll be back and that won't be as impactful as this full closure. In other words, we will not fully close the road at that time. It'll be a localized traffic restriction, most likely done at night and it would be open during the day. So we will not be impacting our uh, friends from Los Osos and, um, and disrupting traffic going between uh, more van and those for school. Well, thank you for being upfront about that. <laughs> I try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Council member Ford. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Paul, for that great report. Um, I'm excited for that to reopen so that that uh, I think the whole city will jump for joy when we can <laughs> return to somewhat normal there. Yeah. Um, and well, I should say cities, Los Osos as well. Um, yeah. I do have a, a follow-up question to Council Member Heller's question about uh, SoCal gas. And I know that the, um, we found, uh, it was found that there were no grounds for reimbursement. Can you explain a little bit more about who, who um, decided that there was no grounds for reimbursement and just give us a little bit more information about that? Yeah, I, I, I may need um, some assistance from our city attorney in terms of the grounds for reimbursement. That would be that would that would go beyond my scope as a as a program manager. But um, you know, I have to come up with an analogy. And I was thinking, Councilmember Heller, as you asked that question, you know, this is the this is similar to if you have a contractor working on your home and you need a utility company to come in and you've arranged for something to happen. The contractor couldn't anticipate that that was going to happen, so they're going to turn to somebody for compensation. And and I don't know if I have a better answer than that um, uh, in terms of who's who's you know who's responsible for that. And I'm glad um, Mr. Newmare has come come on to help me out with this particular one, because again, I'm kind of beyond my I'm over my skis on the grounds for compensation. So um, the issue really is uh, you know who should be paying for it, the contractor or the city. And, uh, you know, one could go back and forth on this, but at the end of the day, if the utility company is not showing up timely and they're not going to provide reimbursement, um, then it's an issue for the city and the contractor to sort out. It's not really the contractor or the city's fault, to be honest. Um, it's the utility company. And uh, if they're not going to provide compensation, then I think uh, Mr. Amico had a good analogy on, you know, as we're waiting for the cable company to come out and they take six hours and then never even show up. <laughs> I mean, you're still waiting when they come the next day. Um, so unless we have a contractual provision that the contractor is supposed to basically cover that cost, which is not necessarily intuitive, then it would generally fall on the city. Uh, we could review this some more contractually to see if there's an obligation, but it doesn't seem like um, that there is an obligation on the contractor side. And frankly, it's, uh, you know, on the utility, but they're not willing to uh, make us whole or Anvil whole, whoever is paying the costs. Okay, thank you. And, and I do have another question regarding um, the water uh, when the, the water main broke or was busted, um, you know, we're responsible to pay for that. But, but Paul, you mentioned that we haven't really <laughs> found out who's, who's taking responsibility for that at this point. And so um, if we okay this additional cost, is this for us to pay for it in case we are found to be responsible or are we paying it upfront and then hoping somebody might reimburse us if they're found to be responsible? How does that work? Uh, that's actually a great question. Um, and and in in this particular case, so the the actual cost, you know, the actual we we get what are called time materials tickets. Anytime Anvil runs into a situation where it di differs from what they believe their scope of work is, they'll notify us of a changing condition. That's what they, they are required to do. That and then that reserves their rights to come back and ask. So they they notified us that this was a changing condition that the water line broke. And that they were incurring additional costs to deal with it because they had water in their trench they had to mobilize crews to pump they had to fix everything and so the city provided 
the city directed them and said, well, you've got this trench open, so you fix this. We'll pay for the materials to get it fixed because we were going to pay, somebody was going to pay for that. Reality was is the water main was broken. And so um, the, all of the additional costs, all those T&M tickets, we've set those aside and said, we'll go and discuss those later. We'll discuss those at a later date and, and we will come back and figure that out. At this point, our position is that Anvil got into this, this particular situation and they may have been a little bit aggressive around that water main and broken the water main. So um, it, it's, it's just one of those cases of, you know, you, there's a, there are a lot of different little things that happen in construction as we go along and we'll end up in the end sort of going through and negotiating around a lot of different things as we, as we go. So, um, um, you know, it's, like I said, this, the case isn't closed on this, but we haven't lost anything by agreeing to pay for the, the actual repair of the water main. We needed to get that done. And the reality was it was broken and they claim it was through no fault of their own. We, we might disagree and we can discuss the other items later. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that as much as you could. <laughs> I appreciate that. And, you know, and I always think of it as like, you know, when you pay a bill, once you pay it, it's really hard to get reimbursement. You know, right. it, it's one of those situations where it's like, if you hold out, will somebody else pay for it? But I understand, I understand the position that we're in, but, um, but thank you for those answers. Thank you, Council Member Ford. Um, Paul, I had a, a follow-up question on the WIFIA site visit. Mm -hmm. Of course, WIFIA is, um, you know, uh, administered through the EPA program, and they're providing um, approximately half of our loan funds, loan proceeds. Was this a, a routine site visit, or were, were there issues that they came out to review? This was a routine site visit. And, and just uh, specifically, what were they looking at or looking for? So, um they, they were looking for, you know, the, our loan has a certain provisions. We have to use American iron and steel for certain pieces of equipment. We have to have certifications for that, those pieces of equipment. In the case of the WERF itself, there were valves uh, that, are, that are manufactured there. It's, it's actually um, these very specialized valves. And so they wanted to get the certification. So they need to come and actually physically view the valve. They got to view the cert. Um, there's also uh, requirements for labor, uh, Department of Industrial La Relations and, and so on. So they need to look at the certified payrolls, make sure that we are following the Davis-Bacon um, um, rates that we agreed to in the contract. Um, and then I think there were a couple other administrative tasks that they, you know, just uh, that they conduct on their routine site visits. Um, the timing of this visit was just because uh, the federal government has now relaxed their travel rules. So now they were able to actually come and travel. They would have loved to have been here, you know, months ago, but um, they couldn't. So were there any issues that they found or concerns that they had as a result? Not at all. Not at all. They were um, our, our colleague, uh, Steve Mimiaga, who is our construction manager. He always conducts a great tour of the WERF. I'm sure a lot of you've been on it and he did a fantastic job educating them about what we're doing here. They were very interested in it, took a lot of pictures. Uh, we got the certifications, we got the payroll in place. Um, uh, and so then, then we were able to take them around and show them the pipelines, and, and um, uh, they were very pleased. So great, went very Good well. Good job, appreciate that, Paul, very much. Okay, that uh, Councilmember Hiller, did you have your hand back up? I do have one last question yeah. I forgot uh -huh. to ask, Paul. So if I did the math correctly, we approved this change order. The contingency for the the piping project basically goes to zero. And the remaining contingency for the sewer plant is about eighty thousand dollars. Is that right? That's correct. So you're looking at the budget now. So you'll be bumping up the overall program budget, or are you going to take money from the recycled water project uh, and and make that part of the contingency for piping, or what? What's the plan? The current plan, we we haven't. We're we're still in the middle of it uh, right now in terms of of calculating what we call the estimated completion of the EAC. So what, what the budget request would be from council. Um, we don't quite have a strategy, we have a fully baked strategy on how we wanna do that. There is contingency in the recycled water um, component. Uh, my colleague, Elaine Simmons, who's, who uh, oversees a lot of that, she and I had a discussion about that. She's reluctant at this point to dig into that because that project is still in the early definition stages in terms of the design and the actual you know, pilot injection testing, um, though that is an option. So. Um, we're still looking at options. We're still looking at what goes into that estimate of completion, um, known change that we have in front of us. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the water reclamation facility. So there may be some opportunities there, cost savings there. So um, as we 
kind of put all these ingredients together, um, we'll be bringing that back to council to discuss how we develop the budget, uh, what that budget request is, what contingencies, how we're going to replenish those, why those are appropriate. Um, and uh, um, so we could take it from the recycled water, but we we we're in the middle of that analysis right now. If you'll just thank you. Know, that's that's my last question, Mayor. Thank you. You bet. No, no worries. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, go to public comment. This is public comment for item C-1 on the agenda. Any member of the public wishing to speak to this item? Public comment is now open. And Highland, sir, do we have any public comment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have one raised hand from Betty Winholz. Welcome, Betty. Thank you, this is Betty Winholz. Um, my question is regard to number 16. You were talking about reimbursement from Southern Cal, but what about reimbursement from those who mark the piping wrong and therefore um, got us into the state water pipeline? Um, that must have cost some money. And um, my other questions have been answered. Thank you. Thank you. Highland, next public comment, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have no more raised hands in the queue. Okay, I'll close public comment, bring it back. And Paul, did you want to quickly address I think you talked about number 16 and the um, um, mismarking uh, issue. You want to just repeat? Yeah, I mean, it's similar situation. To, uh, it's a similar situation to Southern California gas. Not, I mean, similar but different, right? It's the utility owners responsible for marking it, and um, there's also a concept that that if we, if the city would have otherwise, if the city would have paid for it otherwise, then it's fair to, if we would have known about it in design, if everything would have been accurate, we would have identified that then the city would have paid anyway for deepening that sewer uh, or deepening the, the the pipelines potentially could have you know it could have been done a little bit differently but um, unfortunately it's it's like a lot of things trying to seek remedy from an external um, agency that's it's going to be a lot of time and effort to do that um, and in the end had we paid to deepen the the pipelines anyway it's it's sort of it's a it's kind of a gray area in terms of um, it's a heavy lift to try to get that reimbursed i would just say it's it's a lot of time and effort to be able to do that gotcha thanks paul for the excellent report i do appreciate it and for taking the time to answer um, all the questions in detail with that um council i'll entertain either further discussion or a motion on item c-1 what's your pleasure I will go I'll ahead and uh, I go ahead. <laughs> I was going to move to approve, but you go ahead, Mayor. No, no fine. Uh, motion for approval by Council Member Addis. I'll go ahead and second it. So we have a motion and a second for approval of item C 1. And any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote, please. Council Member Addis. Yes. Council Member Ford? Yes. Council Member Heller? No. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 4 1. Great. So that brings us to item C 2. This is a resolution uh, making findings related to the continued existence of a state of emergency due to COVID 19 and reauthorizing for public health and safety the conduct of public meetings of the legislative bodies of the city via remote teleconferencing for a continued 30 day period pursuant to the Brown Act as amended by Assembly Bill 361. And uh, our esteemed attorney will tell you why we're bringing this back again in open session. Mr. Nurmeyer, please. Uh, before kicking it over to, to attorney oh, Chris, uh, sorry, I'll just uh, you know, intro this and, and you pretty much already did that mayor, thank you. Um, just wanted to echo what I think you stated at the outset of this meeting is that we <clears throat> plan to be back in person and depending on how uh, this item goes, potentially hybrid for the April 12th, 2022 city council meeting. And depending on what that, <clears throat> what action council takes tonight on this item, the subsequent advisory board meetings would follow suit. Uh, either being in person on April 12th, after April 12th, or in a hybrid scenario where by the um, board members, whether it's council members or advisory board members could participate uh, via Zoom, as well as be in person, depending on the circumstances. 
Um, so, uh, you know, we appreciate the community's patience. Uh, I know a lot of people had been hoping we'd be here sooner and we certainly did as well. We thought we were there a couple times and uh, of course COVID-19 doesn't care about plans. Um, it has its own approach to how it's gonna operate and we, we just live in this world. Uh, but it appears we're, we're clear now to move forward and we're excited uh, to see our community again in, uh, in the meetings. And like Chris will sort of outline, you know, the various options council can take and depending on that, uh, we'll determine if we're in person only or if in a virtual and, and in person uh, setting moving forward. So take it away, Chris, thanks. Uh, good evening, honorable mayor, members of the city council. So uh, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, there's a few decisions that staff wanted to ask council to make concerning this. Um, as we all know, starting in March 2020, uh, there's been a COVID emergency that has allowed uh, cities, counties, um, public agencies to hold Brown Act meetings through teleconferencing um, through some relaxed rules. And uh, the latest authority, the current one the city's operating under, is that every 30 days the city needs to pass a resolution um, basically affirming that there continue to be conditions for public health and safety to allow teleconferencing. So the latest resolution that was approved by the city council will expire at the end of this week. And so we have a resolution before the council for another 30 days. So as the city manager said, um, the Brown Act bodies can continue to meet uh, through teleconferencing up until uh, April 12th when there'll be the inaugural um, in-person live meeting by the city council. And so between now and April 12th, there will be some other Brown Act bodies that uh, the city staff is recommending still be allowed to meet virtually. So that's the purpose of tonight's resolution. Um, but then we have the larger question of um, moving forward from April 12th onward. And, you know, of course, we don't know uh, where the trajectory of COVID-19 will take us, but as conditions continue to abate, um, uh, staff's wondering if council wants to maintain the option of Brown Act members being able to, if they feel they need to quarantine or they don't personally feel that conditions warrant for them to personally show up, can that Brown Act member, whether it's a planning commission member or a council member, advisory board member, can they teleconference in and then uh, presumably other members will be there in person. And so to allow that option, uh, the staff would need to bring back, you know, another resolution in the next 30 days. Um, the intent is to allow uh, hybrid meetings moving forward for at least members of the public, which does not require the passage of one of these resolutions. Um, and to allow directors or staff to zoom in if they need to quarantine or they just feel that conditions have changed and they'd rather um, socially distance through teleconferencing. Again, the resolution doesn't need to be passed. But the big question is, is what is council's desire for uh, allowing individual Brown Act members, whether it's council members or planning commission members to have the option of teleconferencing? <clears throat> if these resolutions don't keep getting passed every 30 days, that option isn't available. Um, so staff recommends the resolution be passed tonight. So we have another 30 days. The intent is to have in-person meetings April 12th. Um, but should staff bring back another one of these AB 361 resolutions um, within that 30 day window? And the reason would be like I outlined for Brown Act members to choose if they wanted to uh, teleconference or not. Um, otherwise, uh, as the report indicates, conditions continue to abate. And I know we're all looking forward to having the April 12th in-person meeting. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, any questions of council? For Chris, Chris or Scott, Councilmember Hiller. Yes, thank you, Mayor. In reading this item, uh, Chris, uh, it talks about uh, masking strongly recommended. It talks about social distancing being enforced. Are these things that are going to be part of the hybrid meetings that we're that we're talking about coming up soon? So my understanding is that uh, the city will. Uh, be following the state rules now. Uh, the county has no longer any rules that my understanding is that they have in place. Uh, the state rules, I simply quoted them verbatim and the state of California now strongly recommends masking, but it is not um, uh, recommending that, um, that 
the state of California is allowing the city to have in-person meetings while it's strongly recommending masking for everybody. And so um, that is a policy decision on what the city will do with that recommendation. And it's not my place to say what folks should or shouldn't do. And is the same true about the social distancing issue? Um, so again, the state of California and the CDC continue to recommend uh, limited social distancing. Um, you know, the rules seem to be changing every few weeks. Uh, you know, we saw it over the course of the pandemic, the rules would get tighter. They've now been relaxed a bit, uh, quite a bit. Um, but in regards to social distancing, um, you know, short of pulling up the CDC website or state of California's recommendation, you know, there still is limited social distancing that's being recommended but um, we're past uh, the, uh, the days of mandates. So there are recommendations out there. And so um, for these resolutions uh, that city councils, counties are passing, um, there needs to still be either mandates or recommendations from the authorities uh, to have the ability to pass these resolutions. If, if that's answering your question or-, or no, you that, does, that does answer that question for sure. So. So we need to make clear what our recommendations are relative to masking and social distancing. Is that correct? That would be uh, at the uh, discretion of the policymakers and um, uh, management for the city on what recommendations uh, the city would be making. Um, and then the Brown Act option relative to uh, attending virtually has to do with uh, the health of that person and that they might be putting others at risk or themselves at risk if they attended in person, right? Yes. And also, um, you know, a lot of uh, Brown Act bodies, which are, you know, city councils, you know, board of supervisors, advisory boards, uh, the state uh, are relaxing their rules. Other ones continue to tell a conference, um, you know, it's all over the place. And so um, staff wants to know what council's direction is on whether these resolutions should keep coming back for that exact purpose that you said. Um, I, I can't speak for, you know, the five council members. I mean, you know, I sounds like a lot of the council members, you know, intend to show, be there in person on April 12th. I mean, I don't know, maybe by April 12th conditions change and everyone will be glad that they can tell a conference, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but yes, essentially it would leave it up to the Brown Act member to decide whether they want to tell a conference or show up in person. And then if you show up, you know, whether you wear a mask or not is uh, something that's outside of my purview, other than I can state what this, the state of California has said. Right. Okay. Thank you for that, Chris. And then Scott Collins, one question for you. Uh, I think the this particular agenda item mentioned that people will be able to call in and do public comment on an audio basis uh, rather than, than coming to the meeting. Is that going to be something we're going to continue doing in the future, you think, or is this a pandemic related thing? Good, great question. I think the state anticipated that these kind of questions and I think has more flexibility for um, the public than they do for, you know, the Brown Act body. Um, Chris could correct me if, you, if I'm wrong on that, but it, it seems like we'll be able to provide that hybrid setting for community members for the foreseeable future where you could use yeah. the call in feature or and or zoom feature um i i and, and i don't want to be speculate but it seems like we're going to be be in that realm for quite some time because um i think the state has found it, it it enhances the ability for the public to participate and uh and pr participate in the decision making and, and the meeting public meetings right okay yeah. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, Council Member Ford. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question regarding what it looks like for a council member that is not able to come to a meeting because they feel ill. If we go that direction, what, what does that look like? Do we zoom in? Do we call in? Are we on a screen? Like, what is that? What Great that question. Like? Um, Dana and I were having a debate about it earlier today. We, we had touched base with AGP like before the Omicron. So I, I don't remember when that was last fall, I guess, when we thought we were on the cusp of coming back into person and then COVID had other ideas. Um, and I think it will look a lot different than what it looks like today. 
because we're all on Zoom. But once we go back into the room, the vet hall, that becomes the focal point. And my understanding is Zoom would sort of be a telephone. You know, so you think of it that way. You would be interfacing if you were a council member work, you know, working from home, if you weren't able to attend. Um, you'd be interfacing with Zoom, but the community would just hear your voice um, if you were speaking on an item. And th so there's some coordination that would be required between AGP and the staff to ensure, and, the, and whoever the presiding officer is to ensure uh, efficient flow of, of the meetings. Um, so it wouldn't look like what it looks like today. I can, I can say that definitively, what it exactly looks like. <laughs> We're kind of like, okay, well, April 12th would be interesting, you know? <laughs> okay, really I was just, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So it, it's really a, a cost and technology uh, issue. Um, you know, if, if uh, Vets Hall was wired for, uh, you know, um, the latest uh, audio video um, capabilities, then, uh, you know, sure, it could be different. But, um, you know, frankly, it's uh, a question of cost. And, you know, the, the city currently doesn't have um, the equipment to be, as the city manager pointed out, um, putting up big video screens and having lots of video cameras uh, in Vets Hall. Um, so, yeah, and it, it's also there's a, a plug in feature to the existing system that has some limitations and, and, and it's beyond my ability to explain, honestly. Um, but, you know, uh, Chris is correct in that, you know, there are upgrades that need to take place at the Vets Hall facility, period. Um, and we've been aware of those for some time. It's just been hard to get around to the project, but there's some initial quick fixes to ensure that we're able to do the hybrid meeting whether it's with council members participating at the diocese at home, or if it's only community members who are allowed to do that, whatever you decide this, this evening and moving forward, um, we have the quick fix to make it work. Uh, but there are additional upgrades that need to occur for the system, the back end system and the in, in Vets Hall's um, experience uh, to bring us into the 21st century. And that's um, something that Greg Qualick and Dana and myself are looking into with AGP. The technology is certainly there. Uh, it's yeah. something that uh, may be cost prohibitive. Um, now, on the other hand, depending on the uh, course that the pandemic takes, um, it surprised us before, you know, maybe the city would want to look into, uh, you know, investing in the equipment. Um, my understanding is that we don't have, um, you know, uh, accurate estimates on how much it would cost other than it would probably be prohibitive, um, you know, at least understanding uh, where we're at right now, but, you know, council could direct staff to, you know, come back with some cost estimates on upgrading the technology. Certainly some council chambers throughout the state, you know, have that technology. Uh, most of them don't. Okay. Yeah. And the reason I, I, I would even entertain this idea, and this of course would be a future agenda item is I think that something like that would possibly fall under our DEI, um, actions as far as being accessible to as many people and giving them that opportunity to participate in our democracy and our local government, you know, as in person as possible, but maybe they don't have the ability to be there physically. Um, and so, you know, I know that's kind of a sidebar conversation, but I do think that that is something worth entertaining in the future. Do we have it in our budget right now? Probably, you know, probably not, but um, I think it's definitely a future conversation. And I think we're, we're that city that is willing to do big things, even though we're small. So anyway, um, but yeah, that's really my only question other than, um, so can you clarify, Chris, please? Um, or, uh, you, because we talked about the reasons for calling in as being, you know, for concerned that we have symptoms, um, but you also mentioned earlier something along the lines of people that are concerned about just being in a in a setting with other people um is that grounds like if one of our brown act members board members um just feels like they don't want to come because they're uncomfortable does is that grounds for not attending and calling in instead is that what what you were can you clarify that for me i'm sorry sure so if, if the city continues to pass uh the ab 361 resolutions then uh, it would be at the discretion of uh, pretty much the city council and then uh, presumably the city manager um, on 
whether or not folks could be calling in or not. Uh, if the city provides the authority to that individual to, um, you know, take that option, um, you, you know, of course, my understanding is that there are a lot of folks out there that uh, for various reasons, whether they're immunocompromised or uh, they're on some sort of medical regime or, um, you know, just have, a, a, you know, a, a, you know, a certain medical condition that that isn't, um, you know, that the majority of us have that for whatever reasons, you know, they, they still need to keep socially distancing. And um, I would suggest that if um, a Brown Act member uh, concludes that their health and safety uh, warrants them calling in that uh, it would be a lot simpler for the city to just go ahead and uh, take them at their word. Um, if we were to start looking into what their medical reason is, uh, we might be opening up a can of worms on privacy issues. And uh, I'm not even sure how far we would go with that. Um, but I am aware that there are millions of Americans right now that um, aren't in the position that most of us are in um, in regards to uh, being able to relax a lot of these uh, restrictions that, you know, a lot of people have been following. Um, I'm not a doctor uh, and, you know, I'm starting to get uh, outside of the legal analysis here, but uh, I am aware that a lot of folks out there for good reason still continue to social distance and wear masks that uh, due to personal medical um, conditions. Okay, thank you. That That's what I thought when you mentioned those things, but I just wanted clarification, not just for us, but also for those tuning in tonight to know exactly what that means if if one of us or another advisory board member were to not be in attendance if we move and, forward. And, so. and it just also can be as simple as somebody might have been exposed to COVID or or they actually, you know, have COVID and uh, they're following the, um, the recommended quarantine um, uh, timeline and they don't want to show up at the meeting and possibly in fact other folks so okay well that answers my questions thank you guys thanks councilmember ford um other questions looking for hands chris i just i just want to be clear because i think i got a little confused um uh, it's my understanding that one and just th these are questions yes or no um, we we I assume we do not have the technology to uh, appear virtually um, via Zoom and and have ourselves shown on a screen. That that's I'm assuming that right now. So um, the assumption would be that this would allow a member of the uh, a Brown Act body to call in if they determined of their own volition that they were either exposed and needed to either isolate or quarantine or two were high risk and were uncomfortable coming because of that high risk condition. Is that true, correct? Yes. Okay. And then secondarily, um, um, the city is not going to be in the position of vetting that individual with regard to their health status. Is that correct? I strongly Anyone? recommend the city does not uh, engage in vetting um, someone that says that they need to call in. Appreciate that. And then thirdly, um, am I correct in assuming that this also would allow any member of the public who felt the same with regard to their discomfort because of secondary health conditions and or whatever that they wanted to phone in and, and provide public comment that that would that would be allowed under this act? Yes, and we also would have the added benefit of expanding public participation to folks that, uh, um, regardless of uh, COVID, uh, simply want to participate but can't make it physically to Bets Hall that night. Great, and and the last thing, because you got we got off on a little bit of a tangent um, tonight. We are not considering mandating masks or social distancing. That That's is not on. That is not on this agenda. Item. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Great, I just wanted to clarify that, appreciate it. Um, any other questions for Chris? If not, I'm gonna go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C-2 on our agenda and public comment is now open. And Highland, do we have any public comment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have one raised hand from Betty Winholtz. Welcome, Betty. Thank you. Um, this is Betty Winholtz. I just want to say I can't see us going uh, or, you know, after we open on the 12th and we get our board meetings going, um, 
I would hope that this would be what um, members that are participating on boards um, would continue to do and they would show up and meet the public face to face and um, that that would be I, I, I'm not trying to down downgrade COVID but in a sense if you have the flu you stay home um, and so if you don't then you come to the meeting and so I'm, I'm hoping that that's the attitude with which um, our leadership would take uh, both in terms of the council and our different board meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, next public comment, Highland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have no more raised hands in the queue. Oh, Ms. Ava, sorry, I'll be right there. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I was getting some feedback. I'm not sure if that was. No, all good. Okay. Yeah. Ah, sorry about that. The hey. feedback issue has been resolved. Okay, thank you, sir. So public comment is closed. I'm bringing it oh, back to council. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. We have a last minute raised hand from a uh, Ryan Garcia. Okay, I'll go ahead and allow it. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I just want to concur with Betty Winholtz. I, I think she has some good points there. Uh, and I, I understand the concern with with COVID going forward. But I, I feel like it's also time to, to come back in person and and uh, have public meetings again. So that's all I have to say and keep it short. Thanks for letting me speak. You bet, absolutely, appreciate that. Um, Highland, any other public comment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There are no more raised hands. All right, I'll close public comment and I'll bring it back to council and uh, entertain a motion or any further discussion. So um, I will go ahead and um, uh, move the staff recommendation number one and that um, that also for number two um, I would recommend that we we allow for um, the same uh, policy for our advisory uh, body members and for item number three um, I would uh, suggest that we bring back monthly reconsideration of AB 361. I got that right. Did I get it right, Chris? Um, yes, with number two, though, uh, when you say the same policy, do you mean that uh, uh, an individual Brown Act member um, will make their decision whether they feel comfortable uh, calling in or showing up in person? A absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll second. Do, okay. Yeah. Motion by Mayor Heading, uh, seconded by Council Member Addis. And any further discussion? I just have one call. Oh, yes, ahead, please. Council. Now, Council Member Ford had her hand up. You do too. <laughs> Council Member Ford. All right. Thank you, Council Member Addis. Um, I just want to say I'm excited about being in person. Um, you know, I, I, I think that we've all said at some point that um, we're all tired of Zoom. We're all tired of <laughs> seeing each other on these little screens. And um, I think that uh, moving forward with this cho these three choices um, is not saying that we don't want to be in person. I definitely will do my best to be there at all costs, and except for you know, of course, if I've got COVID or been exposed. But um, I think it's also a great way to make those who feel uncomfortable feel comfortable to still participate in our meetings. And I think that that is what it's all about. I feel it's it's welcoming to our whole community. And, um, and I think that that's important. So being accessible, but at the same time, being willing um, to to show up, I think if we can is, is extremely important. So I encourage, you know, our, our council members and fellow advisory um, board members, um, if you can please attend in person, our community has been asking us to they're excited to see us in person, and I hope you're just as excited to see our community as well. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Councilmember Ford. Councilmember Addis, I see your hand. I'll just reiterate the same comments, but also say that I'm very glad that we are opening uh, the possibilities for the public participation. I think that's critical. I'm, um, I'm really glad the state has finally recognized that there's numerous ways to participate. And I think for a community like Morro Bay, it's important that we be as flexible as possible. 
And um, we do have agenda item D, future agenda items later. And I hope council member Ford will bring her ideas back at that time. Thank you. And I'll, I'll um, see if I'm unmuted, good. I'll, I'll just make the comment that, you know, um, for me in the past, if I were ill and had to be home and there was a council meeting, I couldn't participate. So this allows the opportunity for us, if we're well enough, but, but ill to the point where we have some kind of um, contagious um, uh, viral entity, be it COVID or whatever, we have the opportunity to participate. And it also opens up significant opportunity for the public who may not feel comfortable to call in and continue to participate. So um, obviously I'll be supporting the motion because um, I think I was a second or I made the motion. Okay, any further discussion on this item? Very well, I will go ahead and ask for a roll call vote. Council member Addis. Yes. Council member Ford. Yes. Council member Heller. Yes. Council member Barton. Yes. And Mayor Heading. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you for that the great discussion. Very much appreciated. Brings us to item number C-3. This is the, uh, whoops, gotta find my place here. Purpose statement for the city council subcommittee on climate action. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Collins and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Mayor, council members. Uh, brief presentation here. Um, I wanna thank uh, community development director, Scott Graham for meeting with the new uh, newly seated subcommittee members on climate action, council member Ford and, and council member Barton. I uh, met last week with the community member, uh, Don Maruska, who's been doing a lot of work in, in climate action as of late and brainstormed a uh, ideas around a general purpose statement for the subcommittee, which were, um, the subcommittee was tasked with by council, the last council meeting um, to come up with uh, as clear a, a statement as possible to, to ensure to both the, <laughs> the subcommittee members and to council and, and to the community what, what they're going to be working on. Um, so I think they came up with a pretty clear purpose statement and uh, uh, associated with that targeted subcommittee activities. Um, I won't read all the activities, but they kind of support the, the general purpose statement, which is to engage the community to support successful implementation of the city's climate action goals and reduce the adverse impacts of climate change on our quality of life. And then there's uh, six um, activities related to that purpose statement. Um, you know, Scott Graham participated in that. Obviously, the two uh, council members on the subcommittee participated in that discussion. So happy to, to turn it over to them if there's any questions um, from council. That's all I have. Thank you. It's like the mayor timed his, uh, his break. Oh, there I, is. No, I just couldn't. I couldn't get my unmute and my camera to come back on. I'm unlearning Zoom, so I, I'm looking forward to being live here in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you, um, Scott, for that presentation. Um, are there questions for either the subcommittee members or for Mr. Collins? Seeing no questions, I'll go ahead and open up uh, public comment. This is public comment for item C-3 on our agenda. Public comment is now open. And Highland, do we have any public comment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I see no raised hands in the queue. Okay, I will close public comment, bring it back to us. Um, thanks to the subcommittee for their work on this. Appreciate you very much and look forward to some exciting things in the future with regard to this initiative. Um, I will be supporting uh, the item and um, I will either entertain a motion or further discussion. Council Member Heller, see your hand. Oops, there we go. Yeah, yeah you too, huh? You're done with I'm, Zoom. I'm already <laughs> over it. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I just have a few comments. I appreciate what the subcommittee has done. I keep coming back to item four, which is convene a stakeholders roundtable to identify ways to inform and engage the community. My, my concern about this issue, uh, I, I guess the way I'd like us to handle it is to recognize that there are people in the community that do not believe that climate change is real. Um, there are probably a number of people that think, well, we should just do a little bit and not very much. 
And I see this as an opportunity for a dialogue amongst the community, regardless of what your point of view is on climate change, that we have frank discussions and listen to one another uh, with the hope that some kind of consensus will come out of that. It's, it's easy to kind of jump on the bandwagon and say, climate change is something we need to do immediately. We need to do this and we need to do that, whether or not we have the resources to do them or not. I really want it to come out of the community so that there's an understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing doing it and it, with the hope that you know a majority of people support it. Uh, so that's my concern and uh, that's what I hope number four is getting at on this list. And that's what I'm looking for uh, in excuse me, in this process. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Councilmember Hiller. Councilmember Edis. I was just going to move to approve the site. Um, okay. Motion to approve um, item C3. Is there a second? I would assume maybe a subcommittee member. Uh, Councilmember Ford, is that a second? Your hand's up. Yes, I'll second, and then I, I want in a minute, I'll make a comment as well. All right, so we have a motion, Council Member Addis and a second by Council Member Ford for the staff recommendation. Um, and uh, then you go ahead, uh, Council Member Ford, if you have a comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, really quickly, before I, I do my thank yous, I just wanna address your, uh, your comment, Council Member Heller, and I really appreciate what you said, and there is a reason why we didn't specify the stakeholders, and it's for that reason. It hasn't really necessarily been um, defined at this point, and I think that it, you know it's open-ended for a reason. And so I welcome ideas such as yours. I think it's a great comment, and I appreciate it. Um, I I want to thank um, fellow Council Member Barton, um, Dom Mariska, and also um, Scott Graham as well. Um, we had a really great in-depth conversation. Um, you know, our, our staff is, it continues to amaze me. Our community continues to amaze me. Um, so many people want to step in and do what they can when it comes to helping our council be successful in what we do. And so, um, and as, and, and the same goes the other direction as well. I feel as though, um, council member Barton, um, willing to give up her time to go and spend hours to do this, and I'm sure many hours in the future. So I just want to thank everyone for participating in this, and I'm excited to move forward with this item. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Any uh, further comments, uh, Councilmember Addis? I just I want to thank our colleagues for stepping up. The interesting thing about science is that it happens whether we believe in it or not and whether we look for solutions to the issues we're facing or not. And I wanna appreciate um, both of these two people for stepping up to try to address the issues that we're facing. And thank you, make sure I'm unmuted here. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll just echo those comments. I do appreciate Council Member Barton and Ford for taking this on. Um, um, a big initiative, lots of stuff to do and lots of education as I think Council Member Heller has outlined, um, whether you were a believer or not for the, for the community. And so I'm looking forward to seeing some of the actions that will come out of your work. Um, so there are no other comments. We'll go ahead and do a roll call vote, please. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Ford? Yes. Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries by vote. All right, that takes us to item C-4. This is consideration of a proclamation in support of the people of Ukraine. Um, perhaps um, Mr. Collins, I'll just uh, um, remind folks how this got here. I uh, asked for a future agenda item. It was supported unanimously by council. Um, the mayors in San Luis Obispo County got together were concerned about what was happening in Ukraine and wanted to do anything they could with regard to us as individual mayors to make a statement of support for the people of Ukraine. Um, we did that individually, but of course, um, uh, with regard to our own councils, um, I believe the majority of all the mayors have placed this on their agendas and are in the process of approving 
this um, this um, 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 proclamation. And so I bring it tonight, you know, with a very heavy heart uh, personally. And I know um, uh, many of us um, are in shock and awe uh, about what's going on right now in the world and the atrocities that are occurring with regard to Ukraine. And um, there are a number of opportunities for you to make statements individually uh, and use your voice to echo your concerns about the tragedy, uh, the displacement of people, um, especially um, children um, and um, those that are most vulnerable um, with regard to, to what's happening, um, the, the killing, the actual um, war crimes, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's, it's bearing itself daily on the television and it's almost too difficult to watch. And so my heart is heavy and I'm, I'm, I'm asking my colleagues if um, they would support this item, um, making a statement that we are united um, as a body um, in our community and that we denounce the action of the Russian government and the Russian president with regard to what's going on with uh, the Ukrainian invasion. And um, I'll just leave it with that opening. Mr. Collins, didn't mean to steal your thunder, but wanted to make that known. Yeah, <laughs> no, thank you, Mayor. And, the, and I don't have anything to add to that. The, the recommendation, I'm sorry, the proclamation uh, speaks for itself and that's what's recommended and, and it follows along the lines that uh, you just outlined. Thanks. Any questions for myself or Mr. Collins? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C-4 on our agenda. Highland um, public comments now open. Do we have any public comment? Mayor, I see no raised hands in the queue. Okay, I'll close public comment, bring it back to council. And I'll go ahead and move um, approval um, of the, uh, let's see, the title is Proclamation of the City Council of the City of Morro Bay, California, in support of the people of Ukraine. Second. Okay, motion by Mayor Heading, second by, was it Councilmember Barton? Yes. All right. Any comments? Councilmember Addis, please. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to call the public's attention to an article that came out uh, in the Tribune, at least today online, um, about a San Luis Obispo family who is helping a family in the Ukraine, and um, they do have a GoFundMe. And the way that this came about was uh, a local person from the Ukraine asked their church for help. Um, and folks in the congregation immediately stepped up and had relatives in Germany who then took in two mothers and their three children. And so um, you can look, uh, the article is titled Slow Family Helps Five in Ukraine, but the GoFundMe, because somebody had asked, uh, you know, of, about ways to support, um, there is a GoFundMe and it's, it's titled Aid to Six Family Members. Um, so it's two moms and three children that have escaped to Germany and are staying uh, with the Cardell family in Germany at this time. And the Cardell family, many of you know who Amy Cardell is uh, because she's been a writer in this community. So I just I want to say that that is one of many, many avenues to support and to support locally. I also uh, want to call out, and it's a little bit unrelated to the resolution, but there are folks selling things in person and online saying that they're giving money to the Ukraine and they definitely are not. And so as you're donating or buying products to please beware and really research who you're giving to and make sure um, that if you're buying products or donating somewhere that you're doing that with somebody who is verified to be giving those monies. Um, but you can find that article in the Tribune, and that is a local family. Thank you, Councilman Radis, for that. I'm always looking for appropriate ways to help, and there's a lot of bad stuff out there. I absolutely agree. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Heller, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Well, I'm going to be the outlier on this issue, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I, I think, as you had mentioned, Mayor, early on, we all have individual platforms and individual issues that are of particular concern to us. 
which we're at liberty to discuss and raise as part of our announcements or to take action on individually. With the agenda for our city, I really feel that we should be dealing primarily with the pragmatic issues that were challenged by uh, harbor fund deficits uh, and, and a, number of, a number of things that are really just down to earth. What can we do in Morro Bay? I, I don't see the benefit to the city of having proclamations on our agenda um, as noble as they may be. Uh, I just think we have a lot more down to earth city issues that we need to be talking about. So uh, I, I'm not, I can't uh, support this agenda item. Uh, it has nothing to do with my feelings about the issue. I just don't think these proclamations belong on our agendas. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? If not, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote, please. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Ford? Yes. Council Member Heller? No. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Hay? Yes. Motion carries 4 1. Thank you. That takes us to item D, Council Declaration of Future Agenda Items. Um, I'll start. I have been in discussion with Mr. Collins regarding the Harbor Department and um, am suggesting that our detailed look from a budgetary and revenue standpoint um, occur um, during our May um, annual budget review with um, a special session to look at um, the specifics regarding the Harbor Department and capital needs, revenues, et cetera. So, if um, if that's okay with everybody else, we'll bring that back in May as an agenda item that will look specifically at the Harbor Department. That, I support I that, Mayor. Okay, good. Looks like we've got a majority support. Yes, okay. Appreciate that. Any other um, future agenda items? Council Member Ford. All right, I'm going to do this again, where I, I'm going to suggest something that I, you know, on a whim, you know, during our meeting was inspired to bring forth. So um, I'll probably need your help, Mayor, as usual, when it comes to the wording of this. But um, I do want to um, entertain the idea of bringing forth the idea of moving forward with having remote commentary from um, our community and maybe even possibly uh, from Brown Act members. I'm not sure the legality is there, but at least our community moving forward past COVID, the pandemic, what the legalities are, um, you know, without the governor's order once that ends, um, if it's possible to continue doing that. And if so, how do we, you know, can we fund that? Um, what are the costs for AGP to make that happen in the future? Um, what are the cost to make video possible? I mean, why not, why not find out all the things? Um, but I think that um, under our diversity, equity and inclusion action item um, that we, we have reason to consider it. Um, I just don't know if, if it's legal and what the cost would be. Um, I can just <laughs> offer uh, <laughs> Mr. Ford, um, you, you know, we, I know Chris had alluded to the, the issue of cost, but we, we are actually in the process of, of um, trying to understand and evaluate, um, efficiently evaluate what the needs are in the, the vet's hall with regard to audio video. It's actually hard to even get into like knowing what the, what questions to ask. Um, we, we have great partners in AGP, but you know they're a vendor of ours, so we, we have to figure out how to bring somebody in who's you know um, third party to help assess and help us you know work with AGP, um, and then we'd have a better understanding of those those features. Um, Ms. Swanson is looking at a whole new agenda um, management system that could also potentially connect into. The audio video side of things which could bring uh closed caption and perhaps other services at a reasonable cost so there, there are things we're evaluating so uh certainly um this was something that council had asked us to do a while ago it just had been put on the, the back burner for for obvious reasons but it's something we're bringing forward hopefully you know sometime this year so 
I, I don't okay. know if I get specifically to that. So if you want to tailor it a little bit more, but just want to let you know, you all know we're we're actively exploring how to how to improve the the audio video quality and some of these other things could be add-ons potentially. So I, I, I had I had as a as what I captured, Council Member Ford was evaluate the opportunities for virtual audio visual participation by city council members and or community members in council and or advisory body meetings. And um, that is very similar to the initiative, although I think it clarifies it even more by adding the, the virtual audio visual portion of it. So, um, and that would include an evaluation of the legalities because after AB 3, whatever it is, 361 expires, <laughs> I don't know that legally we'll be able to do that, but that would have to be part of the analysis. There's Correct. so many AB yeah. names that, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was hoping you would, ch you know, chime in with with the actual name of it. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, you you got it, you captured it you? exactly. Yeah, well, and I mean, it sounds like our city staff is already on it, um, yeah. but I do, I would like to know if, um, you know, legally, if we can even do it. I just think that it's such a great opportunity for us to be accessible to our community and, and to also be accessible to future council members that might have, you know, comp compromised immune systems or, you know, um, other reasons why they may not be able to attend. Could be childcare related. Could be so many different reasons um, that keep people from running for office um, or for applying for advisory board positions, and um, also prohibits them from attending as a community member or you know someone who wants to come and give public comment or just listen in so right it's just a conversation i would like to right. to have it in the future so yeah got it got it and i saw some heads i saw at least three heads nodding so um i've captured it i think for you for yes us. <laughs> yes any, any you. other future you're welcome future agenda items okay seeing none um, thank you for your participation this evening, our last Zoom meeting, yay. Um, just when I was figuring out how to use the mute, mute, mute button. <laughs> so the next regular meeting of the City of Morro Bay City Council will be held on Tuesday, April the 12th, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. in the Veterans Hall in Morro Bay. people there. <laughs> yeah, and um, does anybody remember the address, <laughs> by the way? <laughs> We'll see no, it's better there. be packed. I got to tell you. I don't know how to get before. there. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you.